National and Subnational. He is also the coordinator for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the regular speaker of SGDs. Dr. Agriwood has over 80 years of progressive experience in engineering design and environmental management. Prior to joining the he worked as a consultant engineer for DevOps engineering in the United Kingdom, where he led multidisciplinary team to provide innovative frameworks and environmental solutions for a number of high profile schemes, including the Manchester Metro Project, the largest light rail scheme in the United Kingdom. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from President of the United Academy of Art and Science, Vice President, past President and Vice President, here present, fellows of the Academy, our friends from the media, students, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Now, I'm such a pleasure to Warmly welcome my mother, who was surprised me by attending at this evening's seminar. I hope that her presence will not cause me to shake on the stage, but do justice to the topic today. So, my plan this evening is to give an insight in how Ghana is translating the sustainable development goals, which is a global Initiative a global framework down into local action. So they first have been somewhere in this time, and then what are we doing with implementing the SDGs in Ghana? And I'll start by talking about the relevance of the SDG in international development, and therefore why we should think about that as an SDG at all. What is the need for us? Then I'll talk about the institutional arrangement, and then the um, Implementation arrangements, including traffic and program implementation, and then on training in sustainable development goals. So, to start off, <coughs> why do we need to bother about the sustainable development goals? It is a great. to our after the Rio last week conference. And uh, it has become an accepted framework that development stakeholders rally around. So, government actually commitment to the SDGs, private sector actually commitment, civil society are interested in the, in the SDGs. So, just like the Millennium Development Goal, it's Which provide a common framework that in various and economic matters can be used to uh, speak about. Unlike the Millennium Development Goal, however, social development issue, the SDGs tries to balance the three pillars of sustainable development. So it addresses economic development issues, it addresses environmental issues, as well as social issues. In addition to that, the SDGs identifies the need for peace and a partnership as important enabling factors for the government to take place. And you will agree with me that where there is no peace and there is fight and conflict, you effectively erode the aims made, uh, government aims made rather than progressing. And then also, development is not only for governments, civil society, businesses. Academia, the general public, all of the state in, in national development. So the SDGs also calls for partnership in implementing the SDGs. One of the main principles of the SDGs have been in the past over the past two days is that the goals are integrated and uh, made, and so it calls for an integrated approach to development. That is to say, moving away from what in cycles, bringing the barriers that we have built around our, uh, 
uh, our terms of operation and protected our patches, breaking those barriers, and then why can have in hand with other stakeholders, both across within a sector and then across sectors, to ensure effective use of resources, effective use of skills and logistics, uh, and then importantly, effective and efficient use of resources. Being a 15 year framework, the SDGs also allows for long term planning. So it moves us away from short term, medium term thinking. Gives us something to aspire for over a long term period. And that in itself brings some stability in the planning, uh, in the planning process. And then importantly for probably somebody like myself in the development and development sector. It also insulates us from short term visions and uh, uh, aspirations that um, some stakeholders expect to bring to the table. So, for instance, um, the, the, um, the SDGs start 15 years and it's likely to cut across various continents. So, over the start and period of the SDGs, the opportunity in governments, probably, um, uh, and then all these, all the different parties have accepted the SDGs in principle and they are integrated into the national planning framework. So, like this, will provide some stability, some content perspective. For even discourse and dialogue between government, businesses, and then um, civil society. Businesses, for instance, are very uh, mindful of short term changes. So, if they see a long term perspective in development, in both their context and their both context, and then provide um, um, they put a wider strategy for national development. And then last one of the least, it's a global framework and uh, good performance and efforts of the SDGs less of bring some international good way. And uh, like uh, they say good days is better than good so, Good will with the economics of nation. They also bring with it some um, benefits, including uh, resources, logistics, and support from various development. So, in a nutshell, the SDG should not be seen as something that has been imposed on us, that has been brought down our roads. In fact, that was instrumental in the planning process. Uh, in, in practice, the SDG. Our president is co chair of the end of the SDG advocates, and we start to benefit a lot if we put all hands on them in working towards the SDGs. <coughs> now, I'll move on to the implementation arrangement for the SDGs in Canada. Following the adoption of the SDGs in September 2015, Canada did uh, some way, and I put them into three phases. The first phase covered the uh, awareness creation. The SDGs is new, we need to make people aware of it. And so, MDPC, together with the uh, other ministries, engaged some key actors, including the media foundation for West Africa, Spain, Ghana, and we organized training programs. Should I say more of awareness creation workshops? for media personnel to tell them about what the SDGs are, what is expected of Ghana, what are some of the likely challenges, and then more importantly, the role of the media in, um, in achieving the SDGs. Uh, we also did uh, a national training exercise for, all, for selected staff of all the 216 districts in the country because in terms of national development, the district is actually where the action takes place. So they need to be aware of what the SDGs are and the ramifications for national development, as well as their role in implementing the sustainable development goals. Then the second tranche of activities looked at the planning process. How do we translate the SDGs from a global framework into national action? What do we need to do? And uh, here, I would bring in the issue, um, Africa's own agenda, which is called Agenda 2063. Um, 
in as much as this discussion is about SDGs, SDGs are very much linked to Africa Agenda 2063 in that there is 90% convergence between Agenda 2063 and SDGs. So the mention of SDGs implicitly includes the SDGs because many of the actions we are taking towards achieving the SDGs would also contribute towards achieving Agenda 2063. So we did a mapping of the SDGs to Agenda 2063 to find the, where the convergence are and then where the um, where the outstanding issues are or where the gaps are uh, between these two frameworks. Then we also went a step further to align our then development framework, which was called Ghana Shared Growth Development Agenda 2, which ended in December 2017, to the SDGs, again to assess the extent to which the plan that we are already implementing is aligned to the SDGs. And through that exercise, we found out that 70% of the SDG indicators were already reflected in GSGDA2. So in, in effect, we were very much um, thinking along the same lines, as it were, for, for the SDGs. Then we also identified where the gaps are, things in the SDGs that are not yet captured in our framework. And uh, now these gaps have been filled with a new framework that spans 2018 to 2021. We also, um, with the help of, if I led by Ghana Statistical Services, did a data assessment for planning for the SDGs and then reporting on the SDGs. Obviously, if you don't have data on any issue, then you don't even know where you are. You don't know the starting point. Let alone know how far you are from the SDG target and therefore put in the necessary interventions to move you from where you are to the SDG target. So the data assessment exercise was very useful and uh, the findings were quite discouraging um, in terms of capacity, in terms of resources, in terms of the um, level of disaggregation for the data required to plan for and then report on the SDGs. We have a long way to go. And uh, some work has already started to bridge the gap between where we are now and what we need to report on the SDGs. And uh, later on in the, in the discussions, I'll be talking about the data assessments for the SDGs. Then we also put in the reporting mechanisms. And essentially, the reporting mechanisms would be through the, the annual progress report, which is part of the decentralized planning system, um, would put in um, the SDG indicators within the national monitoring and evaluation framework, and that will become the basis through which we can report and then track progress of implementation. The third tranche of activities related to the implementation structures. A decision was taken that as a country, we are not going to have a standalone plan for the SDGs. Rather, we would mainstream the SDGs into our normal development process and that the decentralized planning process would be the main vehicle for delivering the SDGs. And so we looked at the decentralized planning system, which makes the, um, the sector agencies and then the district assemblies as the main um, planning agents in the country. And then based on lessons from the MDGs, MDGs era, we augmented this decentralized planning system with three additional committees. Now these committees are the high level ministerial committee made up of 15 ministers, chaired by the Minister for Planning, Professor Jan Balfour, and they report directly to the, of, to the president. Their role is to provide oversight responsibility and promote cross-sectorial collaboration for implementing the SDGs. And, uh, the high-level political, um, high-level ministerial committee also provides that political buy-in and support for implementing the SDGs. Then, at the, what I call the heart of the whole SDG architecture is the implementation coordination committee. The role of that committee is to promote collaboration among sectors and then also between state agencies and then non-state agencies. On this implementation committee, 
civil society has a representation as well as the private sector and as and when necessary other actors are invited including our development partners to discuss strategies for effective implementation of the SDGs across board. Then the last group is the technical group which is a much bigger group made up of over 100 um, people across all sectors, civil society, academia, private sector, and they, their role is to provide technical advice, um, new knowledge, new thinking in terms of um, development within their areas of interest. So they are clustered into various groups. Some are interested in poverty issues, others in, on health issues, um, climate change, etc., etc. And then they provide the technical support. And also for those with, with the ministries, department, and agencies, they are also to serve as champions of the SDGs in their respective institutions. And uh, um, I would uh, move on to the slides. Okay. Um, I wonder if those at the back can see this um, clearly. But this is a representation of the implementation arrangement for the SDGs. Um, ultimately, we all report to the president, but the president has the advisory unit, which supports his role as co-chair of the group of eminent um, advisors on the SDGs. Then this is the implementation coordination committee I spoke about. The committee works closely with NDPC, to provide that coordination role together with development partners, civil society organizations, and then a philanthropy platform, which is looking at mobilizing resources from philanthropy organizations to support development activities. And then for the implementation, we have the regional coordination councils, the ministries, departments, and agencies, um, these are the metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies working together with other non-state actors, including traditional authorities, um, faith-based organizations, to implement development activities across the country. As part of the process of localizing the SDGs, we adopted what we call the three A's approach, which refers to, oops, sorry. I've lost my way now. <laughs> Oops, am I going the wrong direction? Looks like. Okay, yeah. The three A's relating to the first um, three um, boxes up there. So I've talked about the alignment where we mapped whatever we were doing to the SDGs to establish the convergence and then where there are gaps. And then we did the adoption. For the adoption, we looked at every SDG target and indicator and ask the, the basic question, is this target or indicator relevant to Ghana's development? If yes, is it okay in the way it is or we need to make some amendments to it? There are a few we have to make amendments to those targets or indicators to suit our local socioeconomic, political um, development, sorry, um, status as well as our development aspirations. And once we've done this adaptation, we adopted them for use in the national development framework. And then with it came the reporting arrangement. Now, this um, extract provides um, evidence that the coordinated program, which is a constitutional requirement for every president to, um, to, to come up with, is also aligned to the sustainable development goals. The coordinated program has five broad development dimensions, the economic, social, infrastructure, governance, and then international affairs. And to each of these dimensions, there are a number of SDG goals, SDGs that are aligned to these dimensions. But also, interestingly, you would find, you would see that there are some SDGs that cut across multiple development dimensions. So for instance, um, the first one here 
It's SDG 2, no hunger. And SDG 2 covers issues on um, food security, um, mal mal uh, nutrition, and then also agricultural productivity. In Ghana's development framework, or within the context of um, Ghana's development, under uh, economic development, we discuss issues like agricultural productivity. Um, so um, some of you may be aware that for a long time, um, Cocoa Board, for instance, was associated with Ministry of Finance because it was more associated with economic um, development dimension as opposed to agriculture. So um, agriculture is discussed under economic sector. However, um, under the social sector, you also find goal two, because also in goal two, you have issues of malnutrition, which is a social, which we see that a social issue. So the goal, the issues under goal two, within Ghana's um, development, shall I say, um, framework, it cuts across the economic and then the social. And, it, and it's similar for a number of um, other, other goals. For instance, um, and uh, um, another one, goal um, eight, for instance, um, has a number of issues that cut across the social, um, sorry, the, the Ghana's development um, dimensions. So goal eight talks about decent work, it talks about um, employment, it talks about economic growth. So the issues relating to economic growth will be captured under the economic development. Issues about um, employment and uh, other things, bit of it is captured under social. And then also the bit that relates to um, um, governance issues, corporate governance, would be captured under um, the, the corruption, the governance, corruption, and public accountability. So it is not a one-to-one -one map mapping, or you have a goal certain neat and nicely under one of the de development dimensions. They do cut across, and that's how we need to um, look at the SDGs. If you limit yourself to just your um, comfort zone, let me put it that way, you are likely to miss out of other dimensions of the goals. And uh, from the assessment we did, under the five um, development dimensions that I've talked about, this chart shows the percentage of SDG um, targets that fall under each of these development dimensions. So the environmental dimensions has the most of SDG goals captured, and um, SDG targets, sorry, captured under it, and it spreads across the various goals. Again, um, I thought this is worth um, showing to illustrate the points. Looking at it from the perspective of government flagship projects. And over here, I'm, I've looked, I've selected just four of the government flagship projects. There are several of the flagship projects. And then these are the linkages between the flagship projects and then the sustainable development goals. Um, let's take, say, um, planting for food and jobs. Okay, um, that is a, a very popular one. Planting for food and jobs relates to agri increasing agricultural productivity, addressing issues of food security, which will relate to goal two, but then it also relates to job creation, which is goal eight. And then um, if you look at the, the implementation arrangement and strategies for uh, planting for food and jobs, for instance, it is going to contribute to addressing issues of inequalities, especially the divide between the North and South, in terms of um, creating job opportunities. Once you're able to create that job opportunities, it, it helps bridges the, the employment gap between urban areas and then rural areas where most of these activities will take place. So if you look, if you assess these um, in government initiatives critically, you would begin to see that they cut across many of the sustainable development goals. And that in itself is not surprising because one of the principles of the sustainable development goals says that 
the goals are integrated and indivisible, and therefore calls for a move away from cherry picking on the goals to say that I'm only interested in this goal, so forget about the other goals. Because inevitably, actions towards achieving one goal is likely to contribute towards achieving other goals. But the opposite is very true, that actions towards achieving one goal may negatively contribute towards another goal. And my favorite example is um, SDG 7.2 talks about increasing the mix of biofuel in the national energy mix, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. The how is left for countries to decide. So if we decide, for instance, to go for biofuels as a means of increasing the renewable energy mix in Ghana, we will make progress towards achieving SDG 7.2 because biofuel is seen as sustainable. However, you'll be competing with arable lands for agriculture. So agriculture is like, may suffer because we've opted for biofuel. If biofuel is more profitable than pro producing food crops, our farmers are likely to abandon the cassava and then um, um, cocoa yam and the lot, maize, and then go to the more um, <coughs> economically rewarding biofuels. So we would have made great strides towards increasing our renewable energy mix, but then we would start struggling when it comes to food security and then nutrition. So it's very important to properly assess the linkages between the goals and then the actions that needs to be taken. And this is where we need to identify the, those actions with great impact or great multiple effects so that by in, investing in those interventions, the ripple effect is much wider but not um, counterproductive. And uh, that is one sure way we can put our scarce resources to use rather than first either casting them thinly and widely or focusing narrowly on one thing and then mixing the linkages with other segments of the, of the um, economy. Um, last but not the least, um, this um, shows a few more of the um, um, government in flagship initiatives. And this is a mapping I've done showing how they are linked to the various SDGs. And again, each flagship project is linked to one or more of the SDGs and then there are SDGs that are associated with um, multiple flagship projects. Again, some more evidence that the SDGs have been mainstreamed into the national development um, planning process. This is an extract from the, um, the medium-term national development policy framework quite a mouthful, I had to take my time to get it right. This is the framework that guides development planning across the country, and this document spans from 2018 to 2021. This extract looks at, um, if you could read, it, look, it relates to um, population management, and it talks about harnessing the benefits of migration for socioeconomic development. In this column, there are a number of strategies that have been proposed in order to achieve this policy objective. And what we have done at NDPC is to identify the SDGs that each of these strategies is associated with. So for the planning officer at the district or at the ministry, based on your mandate, if you have to do any work or any actions that relates to harnessing the benefit of migration for socioeconomic development, and you decide on which strategy to adopt, straight away you know which SDG that strategy is contributing to. And so that would also help us in tracking actions towards the various SDGs, and then also in reporting on the SDGs. And what we hope this would also help us is to identify those interventions that are contributing effectively towards the SDGs. It's, it's, I think the easiest part has always been to being able to measure the metric. So for instance, population 
um, let's say poverty has dropped by um, 10 percent great but what interventions led to the drop in poverty there are multiple interventions how do you assess which one was the most efficient in bringing about um, a drop in poverty this is always um, where there are tiny issues and uh, it's always not clear cut and we hope um, some of these things would help us do that going forward um, I'm afraid my choice of colors was not the best here, not, not, not very readable. But that's where I now want to talk about the data results. Um, I talked about data assessment that we did. The SDGs has over 230 indicators. Well, the good news is that not all these indicators have um, internationally agreed methods of computation and measurement. So those are called classified as tier three indicators. So there are still, um, there's still work ongoing to define them. I think one which was, well, I found quite um, amusing is one of the indicators that talks about, it's a measurement that relates to local government. Yeah, local government. But interestingly, on the global stage, we couldn't agree on what is local government. In Ghana, local government usually refers to the districts. When you go to other jurisdictions, it means something totally different. And so there's not a globally um, accepted definition of what constitutes local governance. And so we all, the indicator says measure something based on local governance. But then for international comparability, we need to agree on what constitutes local governance. And it means different things to different people. That is at the international stage. Locally in Ghana, we have um, similar challenges. And a typical example is what constitutes a district. When it comes to NDPC or you go to local government, we will tell you there are 216 districts. Well, until the newly created districts came on board. But when you go to the Ghana Police Service, their districts are totally different. So if you want to compare data based on district, you cannot match data that say Ghana statistical services has collected and the data that the police services have collected because the boundaries are not the same. So it also boils down to definition issue. So yes, the words may be the same, but they mean totally different things. And that's why some of the indicators are still um, tier three indicators. But let's come to those that, are, that have the accepted um, method of computation and then uh, method of production. There are about 150 of such indicators for which there is a globally accepted uh, method of computation. As at the time of the assessment, Ghana is already producing 62 of these indicators from our statistical system that we can report on, either through surveys or through um, the um, uh, Ghana Education Service Rec uh, Information Management System or Health Service etc. We can report on, we are already generating data on 62. On 63 of these indicators, we are not generating or computing these indicators, but there is some data within the system that can be pulled together from different sources to do this computation. Some of them we have to um, review or amend the template for collecting the data so that they are in line with the SDG definitions. So that um, as the, the findings that came out of the assessment. Also, um, this is not so clear, but it points out to a very important issue that um, about a third of the indicators that we have, we obtain them through surveys. Um, a large proportion we can obtain through administrative data. Now, the challenge with using survey as a source of data, and we, we experienced that with the first SDG report, which will be published next month, is that surveys, well, apart from being expensive, in Ghana, when, if you are fortunate, you get surveys once every five years. So for instance, when you ask me what's the poverty level in Ghana, my reference point will be the Ghana Living Standard Survey that was conducted in 2013. And that's the figure I can give as official statistic for poverty in Ghana. 
I currently don't know what the poverty level in Ghana is until the net survey which has been done but the, um, the data has been put together and will be ready at the end of the year. So, for instance, again, if you ask me what progress have we made under the SDGs in reducing poverty, I have no clue because we've not measured poverty in 2015, we've not measured poverty in 2017, so I can't tell you what we have done. And that is the, that is the exact challenge that surveys pose. They are, they are five years at best um, spaced, so the intervening years, it's always ch challenging. You have to do some projections or some assumptions to come up with this data. And therefore, we are now pushing for a shift towards the use of administrative data. These are pieces of information you collect on a daily basis. Um, for instance, when we were coming in, um, I think there was a sheet at the front desk where you have to write your name, your institution, et cetera, et cetera. That was collected for the purposes of this function, but we can generate administrative data from it. If it has a, a column for male and female, we could straight away tell how many males are here, how many females are here. If it had a category for um, way to indicate your age, we could tell the, 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 the age span and the various um, age categories that are in this room. If it asks us to provide information, I think, um, on um, your occupation, your designation, we can generate a wealth of information from administrative data at literally no cost, because I don't know how much it costs to print that sheet and then get everybody to fill it. And at the end of the day, it provides very valuable information. Unfortunately, we've not paid attention to administrative data in this country, and that is where we are pushing towards that we establish a robust and effective administrative data system so that we can generate data. If it's so good, we can even generate data on a quarterly basis rather than waiting for the end of the year. And that would help us have nearly, I would say, real-time tracking of progress and then also opportunity to put in corrective measures before it's too late. If you are waiting for every five years to know where you are before you put in corrective measures, I'm afraid um, it may be too late. So the push now is for us to strengthen our administrative data collection system. Um, I, would, um, I would end here briefly. Um, I want to talk briefly about the SDG report. I've, all, I've talked about the um, SDG indicators, which are the basis for reporting on the SDGs and tracking progress. And I've said that for some of the indicators, we have to amend them to suit Ghana's peculiar situation. Um, again, I want to give an example. So if you look at SDG 6, um, indicator on safely managed sanitation, the meaning of safely managed sanitation is different from what we had under MDGs. It talks about sanitation on the premises, um, sorry, toilet facility on the premises, toilet facility that is not shared with other families, and then where the excreta is safely collected and then disposed of. Three key components of what constitutes safely managed sanitation. But because of our social cultural setting, where a lot of families live in compound houses, what SDG expect is that in the compound house, if there are five households, you need five separate toilets that are not shared. Is that, is that realistic, looking at our sociocultural setting and situation? The answer is no. However, the major challenge confronting Ghana, and then where we'll be focusing on, has to do with issues of open, um, open defecation which currently sits at about 18, 18% of Ghanaians practice open defecation. That we can, we can confident, confidently work at. Even if we provide communal latrines, which is shared, which is not SDG compliant, that would move people from doing free range, from going into an enclosed shelter and then, and then doing it there. So, for SDGs, for instance, the, the, the realistic um, aspiration is not for every Ghanaian family to have a toilet facility. That would be a bit far-fetched. 
by looking at a situation, we can make do with shared facilities in the medium term. And then as we cross that bridge and stop open defecation, we can aspire to reach the, um, the dizzy height of having a, w, a WVC one, one more one toilet. I like that. One more one toilet. <laughs> also, also for, um, for some of the indicators, um, we are not able to provide the, the information as per the SDG definition or requirement. And so we've had to use proxies. And uh, that is perfectly allowed in the SDG um, in the era. Um, if you don't have the mechanism, the capacity to generate the data and computation as per the definition, we are allowed to use proxies. So under goal two, there's an indicator for um, food um, security index or something like that. Um, we currently do not compute that indicator. But then um, we have data on um, post-harvest losses, which in, is, is very much related to that indicator. So instead of not reporting on that indicator because we do not compute it, we report on post-harvest losses and say that that is a proxy to the SDG indicator as required. Um, on that note, I would want to end here by saying that since the um, adoption of the SDGs in September 2015, Ghana has busied itself in making sure that we have the, a, a fairly well, a robust institutional arrangement, planning process, look at the data requirement. We've done some work on public awareness creation, and uh, there's still a lot more of work to do in that area to make sure that everyone knows about the SDGs and I know we all know what role we can play in implementing the SDGs and also demanding accountability from duty bearers. If you don't know what is expected, you cannot um, demand accountability. And so the clarion call is that let's all put our hands on deck. Let's not um, be spectators, as our president said. Let us be active participants and then let's support and promote the SDG agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adiyewe, for this very extensive presentation. I'm sure there are several issues and comments or questions that will come from the floor when we open the floor for this. We're fortunate to have our second speaker with us on a very important topic, the possible contribution of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences to the SDGs implementation. We have with us Dr. Eugenia Datiba, a fellow of the Academy, and a retired director from the, one of the United Nations specialized agencies in Geneva, namely the International Labor Organization, ILO. After a relatively brief stint as a lecturer and senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Ghana, she spent 25 years with the ILO and was involved in a number of the organization's global programs at the headquarters and also the field. She had her secondary education at Abu Girls Secondary School. First degree at the University of Ghana, where she won the Macallan Prize for Best Female Degree Results in 1967. <laughs> she has a master's degree, MSc, at the London School of Economics and a PhD, University of Birmingham, UK. She has published extensively on employment issues, post-conflict reintegration and reconstruction challenges, gender issues, and occupational sociology. She is married with children and grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, let us warmly welcome Dr. Eugenia Dattiba.
Good evening to all of you. Um, President of the Academy, Vice Presidents, Fellows, Distinguished Guests, Students, Ladies and Gentlemen. As the Chairperson said, my presentation this evening is on the possible contribution of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. By way of introduction, I want to say this. Before the organization of this particular forum, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences had not played any direct role in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. Although transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development which contains the 17 SDGs and the 169 uh, targets, was adopted almost three years ago, in September 2015, by the UN General Assembly, and came into force on 1st January 2016. Some presenters, and let me quickly add that these are not necessarily fellows of the Academy, as some of the Academy's recent events have still referred to the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, clearly indicating that even among seasoned professionals, there isn't that much awareness of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is noteworthy, however, that a number of the Academy's recent events relate directly or indirectly to some of the themes in the SDGs. For example, managing health care, which was the theme of the 2017 Founders Week, is closely linked to SDG 3 on good health and well-being. Furthermore, the theme for the forthcoming 2018 Founders Week, namely managing national water resources for future survival, relates to Sustainable Goal 6, which is on availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. The above, however, cannot be described as an adequate contribution by the Academy, this National Center of Excellence, to the mammoth work required to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2030 Agenda, as we've already said, and it's been repeatedly said throughout this uh, week, in terms of the number of goals and the wide range of uh, targets and indicators to be implemented, they are often described as ambitious. And again, yesterday we had repeated references to this issue and I, since I've missed the first half of this presentation, I don't know whether my colleague Felix also referred to this. But because there are so many, and they cover all the different challenges of our society, they are not only ambitious, but also very complex. They therefore require that we all chip in all the institutions, all the groups, and all the professions chip in, you know, to help in the implementation. So it is not only government that have to mainstream the sustainable development goals in national and local development plans and programs, but also the private sector has to reflect and interpret the SDGs in corporate strategies and contribute with a civil society to the massive effort and the coherent strategies required to ensure the accelerated implementation of the SDGs. Furthermore, it should be stressed that apart from the roles of government and these other bodies which I've mentioned, some of the materials I consulted to put something together for this presentation also point to contributions which academia should make. And I think yesterday, in one of the presentations also, there was a reference to this particular issue. 
And here I must stress that it's not only the academia that should contribute, but the academia should also realize that they stand to benefit from making this contribution. And later on, we will look at why I say they stand to benefit from for doing this particular thing. My presentation this evening relies primarily on desk research for the analysis and the insights which I'm going to share with you. This is because I have not done any previous work on the Sustainable Development Goals. My main focus is to attempt to identify some of the specific roles which the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences can play in relation to the implementation of the SDGs in the country. Slide two. I hope I know how to update it. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> At this juncture, I want us to look at the outline which I'll be following. So I've had a brief introduction. We are now going to look at some of these specific roles which I've identified in the literature. And then we'll look at some of the potential obstacles. Because we may have the goodwill, but we may encounter also barriers which will prevent our institution from realizing this goodwill. Then we'll look at some elements in the conclusion. I want to have water. The roles the academy can play in relation to the sustainable development goals have to be closely linked to the institution's areas of comparative advantage. Therefore, this section, I want to start by briefly touching on this issue and also examine some activities that other academies and research institutions have carried out in different parts of the world on the SDGs. Since I'm sure our academy can learn from these experiences. Now the academy's comparative advantage. National academies of learning together with universities and other academic institutions can be important drivers of national development by betting of their overall capacity in the generation and dissemination of knowledge, innovation and learning, as well as implementation of such global development frameworks as the Sustainable Development Goals. For those, if any, who are not familiar with the academy, I'm sure the students are not that familiar with the academy. The Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Sciences brings together high level intellectuals, professionals, and experts from the arts and sciences in the country. Its mission is to encourage the creation, acquisition, dissemination, and utilization of knowledge for national development through the promotion of learning. Its specific objectives include the following. To promote the study, extension, and dissemination of knowledge in the arts and sciences. To establish and maintain proper standards of endeavor in all fields of the arts and sciences. To recognize outstanding contributions to the advancement of the arts and sciences in the country. To contribute actively to the development of Ghana and Africa generally by examining and addressing critical issues of development. And to do such things as are conducive or incidental to the attainment of all or any of these objectives which I have mentioned. By looking at these objectives, it's quite clear the, the Academy has a broad mandate to engage also in the implementation of such development frameworks as the SDGs. In addition to this comparative advantage, the academy also stands to gain, as I said earlier on in the introduction, from being involved in this implementation process. I'm saying this because this involvement could enhance perception of the academy's relevance to Ghana's development, as it could demonstrate to all clearly that the academy is a responsive institution that can help the country to grapple with its current developmental challenges, many of which are highlighted 
in the SDGs. Again, performing such a role can also contribute to enhance the Academy's national impact to the larger society, on the larger society, and the larger society's appreciation, better appreciation of the Academy's work and value. It would therefore be prudent for the Academy to develop through its chapters um, some proposal that can shape or guide its contribution to the implementation the, of the SDGs range of social, economic, and environmental goals. So this is the comparative ad, ad, advantage bit. Now, what can we learn from the SDG-related activities undertaken by other academies? Some academies, national, regional, and international, in different parts of the world, are already implementing projects and programs to support the Sustainable Development Goals. And I want to stress that there's a lot we can learn from that. And it also shows that we are a bit behind in terms of now starting our contribution. The Interacademy Partnership Research Project, I, I know most of you, at least the fellows, you, you are familiar with the Interacademy Partnership. The Interacademy Partnership is a global network of over 130 national and regional merit based science, medical, and engineering academies that work together to support the role of science in seeking solutions to the world's most challenging problems. Currently, it has a three-year research project on improving scientific input to global policy making with a focus on the Sustainable Development Goals. It recognizes that the 17 SDGs and their targets and indicators can be attained only with the support of, and I want to quote, the best knowledge, innovation, and application from all sectors that scientists have an essential role to play. And whilst many are already engaged in various capacities, there's a need for many more to lend their expertise to this vital effort. Among the objectives of this uh, inter-academy um, partnership project, research project, is to strengthen the global science community's capacity to support the implementation of the SDGs. More specifically, it aims to raise awareness of the SDGs among the academies. It also aims to es uh, explore opportunities for the academies to support the SDGs more effectively and systematically. As part of its work, the Academy Partnership, Inter-Academy Partnership Research Project undertook a survey in 2016-2017 of its member academies to know the awareness of the SDGs, the engagement that is expected of them, and the structures which have been put in place at the different levels to help in implementing the SDGs. And this was one of their uh, telling you know, findings. They found that there was relatively poor awareness and understanding of the SDGs among some of the member academies. A number of the academies reported that they were already, on the other hand, a number of the academies reported that they were already playing an advisory role, especially at the national level, and were also contributing in other ways, including provision of potentially relevant knowledge or publishing of this relevant knowledge to support the SDGs. Again, many of the surveyed academies were eager to support the SDGs, but awareness of how to do this was reported to be limited. Also limited is the awareness of national and country implementation efforts. They were, however, able to indicate 
how they perceived the role academies could play in relation to the SDGs. And the views they expressed are summarized in the next slide. Which one should I press, the first one? Okay. Yeah, as you can see, I hope you can read from where you are though. <laughs> the academies who responded to this particular uh, questionnaire said, the academies could provide and facilitate access to evidence to inform government policy making, helping them to interpret and prioritize the SDGs and their targets locally, nationally, and regionally. They also reported that the academies could act as interlocutors between policy makers and academia and research communities. The role of academies is vital in communicating not only evidence to policy makers, but also policy and research demand to scientists. The academies could prepare timely position statements, policy briefs, um, expert consensus reports, and so on. They could convene different constituencies at meetings and, and, and so on, again, to support the implementation of the SDGs. They could nominate experts to serve on advisory boards and committees. They could champion coherent research policies that support basic as well as applied research of relevance to the SDGs. They could provide integrated interdisciplinary perspectives. And as we said, we heard yesterday, repeatedly also on the first day, the SDGs are not standalone. And therefore, they should be implemented in an interdisciplinary and intersectorial way. The academies could help to explore gaps, to identify trade-offs and complementarities between and across the SDGs. They could catalyze on their regional and global networks to identify common challenges, to share best practices, and to promote innovative approaches. They could promote the importance of the SDGs, sensitizing their own fellows, and in some countries, other constituencies through open lectures, discussion, and outreach programs. And I think what we are going through this week it falls under this particular function. Again, the academies could monitor and evaluate progress of the SDGs. They could scan the horizon to identify future challenges emerging opportunities and which can be tapped to help implement the SDGs. Additionally, the academies that responded to this uh, inter-academy partnership um, research were able to indicate ways through which they could raise their membership's awareness of the SDGs. Many reported that they had not formulated any plan as such, but they, they were able to suggest how this could be done. And this is the next slide, if I'm not mistaken. The next slide. Anyway, I will go on. One of the strategies was to publish and disseminate relevant articles. This will help inform their members. They could convene meetings and workshops get involved in international programs, use conventional social media to inform and pass on messages. They could incentivize you know, universities and other research institutions, and so on. Set up expert committees on SDGs. The Japanese um, Academy, National Academy, for example, has a specific expert group set up within the academy to deal with SDGs. They could align prizes. We do award prizes sometimes. So we, should, we could align prizes and awards to the SDGs. They could use SDG referenced working groups, run flagship studies on SDGs, use or commission national sustainable reports, and even go to the extent of conducting live TV phone-ins and so on. 
Apparently, Zambia Academy, National Academy, reported that they were doing this. As far as I know, the Ghana Academy was not among the IAP service respondents, this inter-academy. One can, however, reasonably surmise that the service general observation that there was relatively poor awareness and understanding of the SDGs among some member academies is equally applicable to our academy. Because of the general observation, this research project by the IAP, the Inter-Academic Partnership, decided to develop a guide, a, a guide for merit-based academies to raise awareness of the SDGs, to improve the understanding of how the SDGs are being implemented, and to encourage scientists and academies to support the SDGs more effectively. I am of the view that this guide can also be employed by the Ghana Academy if it's serious about developing a, a serious contribution or effective contribution to the implementation of the SDGs in our country. Because the Academy can use it to identify how it can support the SDGs implementation, how it can provide advice to governments about implementation of the goals, and how it can monitor and evaluate progress towards achieving the goals. At this point, therefore, I want us to spend some time looking at the content of the guide. Uh oh, I think you've moved too far, too fast. Uh -huh. Yeah. Apart from an introduction, the guide has four major parts. The first part deals with what the sustainable development goals are. The second part deals, is, deals with why academies should support the SDGs. The third section, how the SDGs are being implemented at the international and national levels. And the last section, how academies can support. You see, there's a, dis a distinction. The, the second point was how, why academies should support. And the fourth one is how academies can support the SDGs. Under what are the SDGs, I'll you know, go fast here, because I think most of the points raised in, the, in, in that part of the guide. We've already covered. We covered them yesterday. The content of the guide, the number of goals, the targets, and so on. The fact that it's an aspirational framework which can help guide our development effort to make it inclusive and to ensure that no one is left behind. The next section of the guide covers, as I said, why academies should support their sustainable development goals. It points out that academies can ensure that national and regional research agendas reflect the, the SDGs. An example is given of the European Union's Horizon 2020, which is described as the largest single multinational research fund in the world, which now makes the SDGs an integral part of its reference framework for assessing research proposals. The section further points out that academies can provide expertise to put the SDGs into context and explain their importance, courses, and trajectories. They can also help to devise monitoring and evaluation frameworks. And additionally, it stresses that the realization of the SDGs will require the best minds, resources, business models, and innovations from all sectors and disciplines and across all generations. Hence, the importance of academies in this endeavor. The third section of the guide, which covers how the SDGs are being implemented, provides information on the main UN infrastructure at the international level for such implementation namely the high-level political forum, 
referred to in brief as HLPF, that reviews the SDGs implementation each year. The guide stresses that the work of this body is informed by a report that assesses progress that is put together, you know, under the UN Secretary General. Again, the HLPF is supported by the Technology facilita Facilitation Mechanism, geared to strengthen STIs, science, technology, and innovation usage in the SDGs. This section of the guide also draws attention to contributions by other UN and non-UN institutions, like the UN SDSN, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Network. We are told, for example, that its outfit in Australasia, Australia is, um, has prepared a guide for universities on the SDGs. Furthermore, they've set up something which they call the SDG Academy, which is a virtual platform providing free, high quality, mass online education on the SDGs and plays a role in data monitoring and accountability. It also draws attention to what the regional academies are doing. So NASAC, for example, the Academy Networks in Africa is mentioned. The IANAS, the Academy Networks in Network in America, in the Americas. Then we have ASA, I hope I'm pronouncing it well, which is the Academy Network in Asia. And then IASAC, that's the Academy Network in Europe. And we are told that they can also strengthen the work they are doing on the SDGs. And they can also liaise or enter into collaborative work on the SDGs with the various UN regional bodies. We are told also about how the reporting on the SDGs and the implementation of the, of, of the SDGs, how these are monitored or conducted at the national level. And we are told that in many countries, it's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that, takes, that is the lead agency. I think here is what, NDPC? It is NDPC in Ghana, so we are different. All the national institutions together also produce the voluntary national review reports. This is a report on the country's progress in the SDGs implementation. The IAP guide stresses that the national academies can join hands with these relevant governmental bodies, the ministries, NDPCs, and so on, and to prepare this voluntary national review report. And they can also provide some of the relevant data to fill the data gaps which may exist, you know, um, in the preparation of these reports. The last section of the guide covers how academies can support implementation of the SDGs. And a number of ideas are suggested. They can provide independent science advice, contribute to the formulation of national and other action plans to support the SDGs implementation. I don't want to go through all of them because of the time constraint. Again, some of the things they mention under this section, they also mention under the sections we have already looked at. In addition, the guide ends with a summary of identified avenues through which academies can support the SDGs. And here, I don't want to go through all of it, I'll just point to a couple that the academies can participate in international research, monitoring and evaluation programs on the SDGs. They can reflect the SDGs in their own programs and initiatives. We can see that the contents of the guide, the IAP guide, relate to science academies. The IAP is a network, a global network of science academies. However, in my view, 
they seem to be equally applicable to the arts and social science academies or sections of such academies. Now slide seven, I want us to look at other academies organized SDG related fora. The Ghana Academy can also join hands with other national, regional, and international bodies to organize workshops and other fora to examine challenging issues of relevance to the SDGs. For example, the Tanzania Academy of Sciences collaborated with NASAC, the African Network of Academies, the French Academy of Sciences, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the IAP, the Interacademy Partnerships, and other organizations to, mark, to organize in March this year an international forum in Dar es Salaam on women and sustainable development in Africa. And this came up with a number of suggestions looking first at how women cannot be ignored, even if you have just one SDG on women. It should be realized that you cannot achieve any of the other SDGs without also considering women. Because women have the ideas which can also help in terms of shaping and formulating effective responses at the national level. IANAS, the Inter-American Network of Academies, um, has also recently, just last month, May, convened a regional workshop in Mexico to identify targeted locally relevant ways in which the academies can support implementation of the SDGs and also build their own national and regional capacity. The workshop brought together not only representatives of the national academies that make up IANAS, but also young academy members and national and regional policy makers to gather their insights on implementation of the SDGs. A similar workshop is also planned for Europe by EASAC, European Academies uh, Science Advisory Council. This is actually to be held in September in Germany. And this will deal specifically with the SDGs and communication strategies. Communication strategies are supposed to be very important in, in terms of implementing the SDGs, just as they are with respect to implementing other regional and national plans. The African Union's 2063, this was mentioned in the first day of the forum, points out that while past frameworks were known only to bureaucrats, Agenda 2063, the African Union's one, is to be driven and owned by the people and thus, this underscores the importance of developing a communication strategy as an integral part of its implementation. I think this point is equally applicable to the implementation of the SDGs. And this is why it's being covered in the uh, forthcoming meeting that is planned by EASAC. Data collection and its disaggregation to aid monitoring um, Felix is the expert on this issue, <laughs> um, and I'm sure he's already touched on it, because when I walked in, I had administrative data and so on. So I think it's been touched on, and so maybe I can skip that part as well. But what I want to stress is the setting up of a database on the SDGs implementation. Having a readily accessible database containing relevant national and other materials on the diverse SDGs is a valuable asset that national, regional, or international academies can provide. For instance, the Global Interacademy Partnership has set up a database containing published SDG relevant national, regional, and global outputs submitted by its national and regional member academies. Such a database could underpin any research-based knowledge development by any of the stakeholders. The Ghana Academy clearly can play a useful role in this area by either setting up such a database itself 
or assisting one of the national stakeholders you know, to do so. There was uh, a meeting held in, again in May 2018, a national dialogue. I don't know whether you've referred to this. You didn't, so I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. He was one of the organizers, but a number of institutions at the national level came to go, together to organize it. It was a national dialogue, and the specific theme was the role of data, technology, and innovation in achieving the Agenda 2030. This is the SDG. It was convened in Accra by all these bodies, civil society platform, the Minister of Planning, Private Enterprise Federation, um, NDPC of course, ISA from Legon, GIZ, you know, the, in, in, in German they call it GIZ, but I think it's GEZ, isn't it? And other bodies. It identified a number of data challenges that needed to be tackled to aid implementation and progress monitoring of the SDGs at the different levels. They identified also challenges and other issues that can also be borne in mind by the Ghana Academy if it decides to assist in this area. Among them are the data gaps, how to tap and strengthen various forms of data which exist, administrative enterprise and so on, how to harness ICT and other innovative approaches to generate and make use of the required data to meet these complex SDG targets, and how to not only collect, but also to put spotlight on some of the most vulnerable groups that are being left behind by our development. They also mentioned problems with accuracy and quality of the data we currently have, and how to avoid duplication of efforts in data collection, and ensure that we share data in the country. Again, gender disaggregation was also stressed. Attention was also drawn to data storage and I'm not an expert on data collection or data storage, so I think uh, Felix can explain that to us um, later. The VNR, I think, you know, we've touched on it, but I just want to draw attention to the fact that in my desk research, I looked at a couple of the national VNR reports that had been done. I'm told that already we've had, what, 48, not, 48 are under preparation, but 65 countries have already completed their VNR, their national voluntary review process of their implementation of the SDGs. And 48 are already preparing. I suppose Ghana is one of the 48, because you are now, huh? Next year. <laughs> But what I found in my little uh, review of the two, two of two of these VNRs, uh, was that in some cases, the national academies have been brought on board to help with the preparation of the, of the uh, VNR. Um, I observed, for example, that in the case of the Republic of Korea, the relevant government ministry coordinating preparation of the reports called upon local and international academic institutions, which contributed to the review by undertaking interviews with the relevant stakeholders, collecting statistical data, producing a background paper, and even providing editorial support, even editing of the reports prepared, you know, um, the academy was able to bring, come in, or the various research institutions, they were able to come in to help um, edit the report. I also learned that a number of institutions were brought on board to help in this preparation. So the academy collaborated with these institutions in doing this work with regard to the SDGs. One other role which um, I, I learned in terms of uh, review of this uh, VNR reports was that in some cases, some of the 
um, in, in some of the countries, the academy and other research institutions were able to help to identify existing local laws, regulations, and policies which are conducive to achieving the SDGs or inimical to the SDGs implementation and the achievement of their desired impact. Again, it was reported in one of them that the Academy can participate or help in participating or organizing advocacy and awareness raising on the SDGs. Slide eight. Lessons for the Academy from experiences of universities and other research institutions. We can learn not only from what other academies have done or are doing, but also from what universities and other research institutions are doing in different parts of the world. For example, an annual conference in 2016, which was organized by the University of Newcastle's Institute for Sustainability, pointed to roles that researchers and research institutions can play in relation to the SDGs. I'm not going to list all of them, just a couple. They can help to measure progress. We know that already because we've come across it in the other parts. They can assess indicators and data sets, including ways to monitor them and find ways to measure SDG in in indicators more holistically. They can co-create, means creating with other institutions, research for the SDGs. While research can be done for and on behalf of the SDGs, researchers also need to ensure that such research makes a positive impact. They should work not only with other academic institutions and the government, but also with civil society organizations and NGOs, and participate in meetings and reviews on SDGs, not only at the national level, but also in the regional, at the regional and international levels. So this is part of what the univer one university at least has done. And another thing which has been done by some of the universities with the help of SDSN, this is the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, is that they've developed a guide on, for universities on the SDGs. The actual title is SDGs in Universities, Higher Education Institutions in the Academic Sector. And I think this is very useful and is something that we can also look at in connection with the IAP, you know, Guide for Merit-Based Academies. Now, one of the things stressed um, is that we need an integrated approach when considering the SDGs or when examining or studying the SDGs. So this is one issue which I want to touch on. And I think we also have um, a comparative advantage here because the academy consists of a number of disciplines, people from di different disciplinary backgrounds. So they can come together to undertake a more coherent or interdisciplinary or um, integrated research. It stressed that rather than traditional disciplinary approaches, implementation of the SDGs requires interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches, which bring all disciplines and sectors together. The need for an integrated or cross-sectoral approach in implementing the SDGs is amply illustrated by some of the ongoing research work elsewhere in, you know, on the SDGs. For example, um, in a discussion in a, you know, a, a symposium which was recently organized by the Canadian IDRC and the Think Tank Initiative on SDG3, the SDG3 is on health and well-being, demonstrated that this goal will not be achieved without progress being made in all the other interrelated goals as well. 
In the same vein, progress towards goal three will also contribute to the success of the other goals. Following from a meeting of 60 academic institutions and think tanks in 2015 on how to assist speeding up of the implementation of the SDGs on health, a series of regional and global consultations of such institutions were also held in 2016, which generated insights into the needs and challenges towards SDG implementation, and also provided opportunities to share knowledge and experience in addition to mobilizing ideas for collective action. Um, I'll just mention a couple of the ideas that were generated. We need quality, credible, and accessible data relating to all aspects of public health because they looked at SDG 3 but in its entirety. We need to understand how progress towards the SDGs will be made, tracked, and reported on at the national level as well as at the local level. We need to generate useful data, analysis, and evidence that speaks to the interrelated SDGs. And we should you know, help realize that achieving good governance and strong, effective institutions is key to achieving the health-related SDG. There's another thing that has been produced, turning promises. This is on women, and again showing the integrated and cross-sectoral you know, um, um, data collection that we need um, and how academies and research institutions can help. There's been a recent publication by the UN Women on turning promises into action, gender equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this demonstrates that despite having a specific SDG 5 on gender equality, Gender equality is also central to all of them. I have said this already. The challenging issues covered by each of the goals, like poverty, hunger, health, education, water, energy and decent work, climate change and conflict, affect women more than men. So we need to look at the gender equality thing, not only by looking at that particular agenda, uh, SDG 5, but also more holistically. A recent research article by Yun Min Mi Kim on gender and sustainable development goals also shows that having a specific SDG on gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls will not ensure overall reduction in gender gaps in all the key areas covered by the SDGs. So uh, she proposes utilization of the Global Gender Gap Index. Maybe those that are working on gender, they are familiar with this. This is you know, um, an index that is produced by the World Economic Forum. And, look, and it looks at gender gaps in each of the specific sectors. So gender gap in economics or in terms of jobs, gender gap in health, in education, in politics, and so on. And it shows that in even the same country, you can find disparity between the gender level in each of these areas. And therefore, the need to look at this issue, um, the gender equality issue, at the country level in terms of the SDG in this holistic manner, employing the GGGI. Serious analysis of such gender gaps in each of the areas can also has to be undertaken by Ghana. If this has not already been done, I haven't seen your baseline report, so I don't know whether it's been done. But this has to be done because of the importance of uh, this gender issue in tackling all the SDGs. Um, gender research experts in the academy can support the relevant N NGOs and others to focus on this issue as an integral aspect of the SDGs integrated implementation. But in saying this, and I'm saying this laughing, I think we should look at our chapters, the list of our eight chapters, and you find 
that there's no visibility given to gender. Gender does not appear anywhere. Maybe the emphasis was on gender mainstreaming. Um, gender mainstreaming, but as you can see from Agenda 2030, in addition to having gender mainstreamed in all the 17 goals, you also have a specific goal, SDG 5, on gender equality. And I think we should learn from this and put gender somewhere in our chapters, our list of chapters. There are other aspects of the integration between the diverse SDGs which researchers such as those with national academies can investigate. For example, recently the International Council for Science has examined the interlinkages not only between the different SDGs but also between their targets to ascertain to what extent the interactions reinforce or conflict with each other. It's, in some cases, they buttress each other. They reinforce each other. But in a few cases, they conflict. And so it's important that we are able to identify this. And they've actually gone, gone to the extent of developing a way of um, allotting, measuring this. So you have zero for no interaction at all. And then you have minus three for you know, conflicting you know, interaction and so on. But I don't want to go through all of this. <clears throat> other potential roles. There are other potential roles the academy can play in relation to the SDGs. The academy can provide neutral spaces, new spaces to facilitate interaction between the government and other actors or the people to formulate various concrete and scalable activities to implement the SDGs. As you all know, the academy is a repository of knowledge and expertise that span almost all the themes covered by the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And therefore, the academy can join hands with key national players and groups and development agencies, uh, philanthropic organizations and communities, even communities, um, to develop, you know, um, a broader way, a broader way of looking at the SDGs and seeing that they achieve um, better impact. Now, to guide the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in playing a substantive role in relation to the SDGs, the academy has to develop an action plan. That's that's my humble view that will specify in concrete terms what this role will be and how it will collaborate with other stakeholders in the country. This role can rely on existing chapters of the academy. Can we have um, the slide on the chapters? Yeah. For those not familiar with the academy's chapters, the chapters are groupings according to disciplinary interests. They are required to concern themselves with their fields of study and pursue, encourage, and disseminate knowledge in those fields. They are also to distill relevant information and policy implications of gas lectures, symposia, etc., as well as special studies, and make such, such information analysis available to government, parliament, other agencies, development par partners, and the wider public. I am of the view that each of the chapters actually corresponds to some or at least one of the SDGs. So I have prepared this table. And you can see, for example, education is SDG 4, health and sanitation 3 and 6, political, constitutional, and legal affairs 16 and 10, Food and Agriculture, 2 and 12. Language, Culture, and the Arts, that was difficult because I didn't know where, so I put it under Education. <laughs> Natural Resources, Energy, and Environment, 7, 11, 13, 14, 15. Social and Economic Affairs, 1, 8, 9, 10, and 12. Science, Technology, and Engineering, 9, 4, 15, and 14. So you can see that you can easily divide um, the chapters 
you know, uh, in terms of the SDGs. Furthermore, the chapters are to perform any other function as the Academies Council may direct from time to time. Thus, the Academies Council can direct that the chapters examine the SDGs thoroughly to identify areas they could contribute to. The results of this exercise can be used to prepare the Academy's action plan to show its firm commitment to the implementation of the SDGs. In doing this, as I said, we need to rectify this um, lack of visibility of gender in our list of um, chapters. Now, any potential obstacles, I'll touch on this briefly. I think that's the next slide. We need to note that the Academy's contribution to the SDGs implementation can be facilitated or impeded by a number of constraints. In the survey by the IAP research, which I referred to earlier, um, a number of barriers were encountered by academies which were reported, and these are summarized in this particular uh, table, slide, because I think they are pertinent also to our academy. The, the barrier relates to the academy's own capacity and capability, the, their possession of the requisite knowledge with regard to the SDGs and so on, to be able to play a, a major role here. One of the major constraints or barriers related also to resources, financial and human. Visibility. Some academies felt or feel, still feel, either unrecognized or underutilized and are rarely approached by their governments for advice and support. So this, of course, will limit their willingness to, you know, come forward to suggest that they want to help with the implementation of the SDGs. There are also gaps in scientific knowledge with regard to some of the goals. There's little at least perceived integration or alignment of national priorities and international commitments, with the former being the focus for many governments. So because there's they don't see this integration or alignment. It's, they don't come forward to you know, suggest or propose that they want to help with the implementation of the SDGs. We know that the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences is perennially limited by access to funding. And the extent to which it is able to collaborate with institutions in the national umbrella of organizations responsible for the SDGs can be termed its main constraint also. Thus, the Academy's attempt to identify its possible contribution to the SDGs implementation should also be accompanied by a serious effort to mobilize the requisite funding for the realization of this contribution. Now, in conclusion, let me say that apart from this week's public forum on the Sustainable Development Goals, the Academy is yet to integrate the SDGs consciously into its ongoing activities. Considering that the SDGs were adopted in September 2015, one could say that the Ghana Academy has not acted quickly enough in this area. My presentation is a humble attempt to show that the Academy can make a contribution to the SDGs implementation and also has the capacity to do so. In doing this, it can learn from the work on SDGs undertaken by other academies and also other research institutions and universities. It is our hope that as one of the follow-ups, it is my hope, not ours, because I haven't consulted you. It is my hope that as one of the follow-ups to this forum, the Academy will have an opportunity in the near future to share with the other national stakeholders its specific planned contributions to the national implementation effort on the SDGs. In the meantime, the various stakeholders at the helm of the country's implementation of SDGs should also make an effort 
to involve the academy in their diverse ongoing activities to achieve the five Ps, namely promote the welfare of people, protect our planet, and promote prosperity and peace for all as well as partnership. As, for, as has been repeatedly underscored during this forum, and also by the recent uh, high-level African roundtable on the implementation of the SDGs, governments alone cannot achieve the SDGs. All hands must be on deck, I heard my colleague Felix say, to accelerate implementation of the goals in the country. To facilitate this process, it would be prudent for the academy to have focal points based on the different chapters, as I have said already, but I'm stressing this also in the conclusion. The Ghana Academy, this is my last word, can do more to raise the profile of the SDGs in its work. As earlier indicated, contributing to the SDGs will enhance the Academy's continued relevance to the society in which it operates. Thank you. We shall have a round of questions and answers. Uh, I think we we'll start with the students. Um, uh, shall we start with the students, the younger generation? Or you want the oldest, to, the older ones to start? Yes. <laughs> okay, sh shall we? Shall we open it up? Uh, any questions? Okay. The student and then the other person. Yeah. My name is Mami Kwanami from ACC. My question is, there is a academy, the academy is made up of highly intelligent who are to advise government and other relevant bodies on national development. And the academy is taking on the SDGs and explain to us as to which students here are. There is no presence of any official from the, like, I mean, the government, the presence of the government. We have people from the National Planning Commission, but no, no media has, or no national media has is here to carry the information out to the government. And from this presentation, the government is the main stakeholder in the implementation of the Yes, they are very simultaneously. So how do the views and contributions of the academic 
to the government. Okay. Thank, Thank you. There's no way. My name is Paul, Christian, from Bolivia Warehouse of Station of Ghana. My first question goes to the first speaker. He, I, I read something on the slide that they, not all the targets are set for 2030, some are for 2017, 2020, and then 2025. I would be happy if you can throw more light on that. Now, the second speaker stressed so much on the IAP guide. And then I found it so fascinating because I realized it, it gives profound insights into a whole lot of the SDG. But those of us who are not yet fellows of the academy, is there any way we can get access to the guide? Because personally, I think it will help me a great deal in pushing the SDG. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. There and then. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, my name is Marshall. I'm from SEC. Please, my name is the first person who was presenting the event. And I, the first person I'm the person. Some of the SDGs can be achieved in 10 years. I want to know what are some of the SDGs that are achieved in 2017. Okay. And the next question is what are. Thank you very much. Shall we have the last one for this round? We'll, we'll have another round. Frederick, in front. This one then will fill up the academy. Thank you very much. I want to congratulate the speakers for very thorough presentations. On Monday, I asked some questions. Responded somewhat to, um, to some of my concerns, and uh, but I still have some. Um, I think that the issue of um, domesticated ESDGs has been amplified by Dr. Eugenia Petiba, and uh, she's brought out very clearly what the academy should be doing. But it goes back to the question I asked uh, your boss the other day, but, uh, um, Great yeah, idea. about what, you know, you were talking about how there is, what, 70% convergence between the SDGs and the National Development Plan. So clearly, if we were to um, achieve the SDGs, we would also be very far ahead in our development. And my concern was, or what was being done differently. And I'm not sure that I got that sense of business unusual. I got the sense that this is very much something and we've got the cross sectoral planning groups, etc. and everything is happening. And, and I, I still do not, and I, I so I think that um, this is brilliant. The, the, the details that Dr. Latifa provided that show what we as an academy are not doing. It reflects very much how development occurs in this country. That you put in silos, there are all these experts who are regularly consulted and others are not. So I suppose that we, we have learned, we are both learning, and it should go a long way perhaps in reorienting us and showing us that. If, if the SDGs and when uh, the, the chat about the academy and our charters, and, and I actually do disagree with you because I think you can put SDG 5 in almost all the columns without it being separate too. But it just means that if we must take this thing much more seriously than something that has been signed in New York and something that concerns all of us very intimately. Okay. Now, my other concern is about uh, yes, the data. When you were saying that because you could not find the indicators, you know, we hear the 
example of household toilets, for example. My concern is that we should not dilute some of this simply because we cannot find the data. I, I agree that it's, it's still not one person, one toilet, but there are so many important things. And when you refer to the post harvest loss and food security, I thought that that was one addition that was dangerous because um, food security is not only accounted for by what we produce, we import a lot of things. So just measuring post harvest loss, and, and I start to be corrected by our chair for, for the evening on that, you know, because even if you measure your post harvest losses, the fact that you import a whole lot of things can balance the equation, you know. So I just hope that we will strive at getting better and more data. And you know it better than me. I've recently been doing some work. And on a lot of things, the data is simply not fair. You know, fair and they are all very concrete. They are all the ESDGs. And they are, as you showed, on each of the targets, they are not more than one in data. So however you twist it, you are not finding the data. And it goes back to data collection. So I'm hoping that we can persuade Dr. Latiman to come back and do the presentation to the NDPC as well as to the statistical service. Because I think we need much more dialogue that we can't carry on the way we've been going if we are going to achieve the SDGs. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Shall we take the responses, please? You can start. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the questions. Uh, I remember in my university days, uh, one of the um, courses for the exams, the exam of all these rules, I kept all questions. And he says, don't try to answer all questions. So we can attempt it. And I think that's exactly what I would be doing.
climate change and uh, um, sustainable consumption and production um, patterns. And there's a target, a target for many that these issues are integrated into the uh, school curriculum. And so um, we, we are easy with GDS to see that those things are done by the six and uh, targets here that's been given us. Um, there was a question about how the information will reach out and the government is not here. Um, well, I would say I'm representing government, but then uh, they, I believe as he is recorded, the academy can write a, a note, a briefing note on this and then make a submission to government. So although you don't see a minister here or a high ranking public official here, the information can adequately be presented to government through the right channel. So don't let that be a, a concern. Don't lose sleep over that. On the different targets here, um, many of the indicators um, have targets here for 20 days, but there are a few that um, need to be achieved for 20 days for a number of reasons. Some of the targets are seen as uh, frequencies for achieving other okay. targets. It necessarily must endeavor to achieve those targets so that you can leverage on that to achieve other targets. That's why the dates of those are ending. And then um, also there are some of the targets that are based on previously agreed global conventions. I think those can help. Um, there's been a uh, WHO framework on all uh, nutrition and expansion and all those things. And the target here for that is 2025. So we are not going to change that because the SDG is 20 days. And we start the 2025 target case. And those things are very important that I think we should work at them rigorously to achieve those before 20 days. And someone was interested in the target for 2017. It's a target that relates to access to internet usage. I think we have talked about internet usage. Um, and the set year for achieving that for the post 2017, which is past. The government achieved that. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know because we have not collected data on that. The last time we collected data on internet usage um, was at the GLSS 6 and the current GLSS, which I'm aware of, include collected data on this indicator, will be published at the end of the year. So until that document is published, um, I cannot tell whether we achieve that target or not.
some way, the good news is some way has started on it. Um, there has been a service assigned to enable you with statistics to Denmark to support Ghana in developing the administrative data system, which is one of the approaches we want to use, as opposed to the surveys which we use under the uh, MDGs. And then also, one thing we don't have in Ghana is um, data certification protocols. So it is difficult to pull out data from collected by civil society and use it as part of official government report or official government statistics because the big question comes about the methodology used and so you cannot marry it to sets of data and that has been a challenge. So civil society by this sector may collect very good um, data but it cannot be part of official statistics. Um, we are working with TSS Kansas Services, it's working with um, South Africa Statistics uh, Service, whatever it is, to develop uh, protocols so that we can standardize the methods of data collection so that anybody who collects that data and is certified to use the right approach can then become uh, part of official uh, government statistics and then we can use that. And uh, the intent is not to dilute some of the issues because the data is not there. It's uh, because we need to report, we need to have a sense of where we are. And uh, just as we, we are trying to use the close estimates that we, we, can, we can make it. But going forward, the aspiration is that we strengthen our data collection system, stay the um, SDG better data protocols for all the Make sure that whatever we collect, see Ghana's development, aspirations and projects, best of all, Ghana's development agenda is a priority, and then as we do that, we speak to the SDGs as well. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>
Do you have any further questions? <laughs> that, that, there is one last one from a student there. Please make it very short. Take it away. Straight to the point, please. Over to you, NDP. <laughs> NDPs. Thank you very much. We would have the chairman give the closing remarks, please. <laughs> From the responses you gave for the questions, the chairman's remarks must be brief before you walk out of the auditorium. <laughs> President of the Academy, distinguished fellows of the Academy, and our friends who have joined us the last three days. It's been a very exciting time of learning. Let us give a hand to all the speakers who have come to help us with this thing. We have been treated to very stimulating lectures with a lot of facts. This evening has not been any difference, and it's been very good hearing our colleague from the NDPC and our fellow, Dr. Datiba. I remember what she said, the academy can do more. There's a lot we can all think through and reorganize ourselves so we can contribute to Ghana attaining SDGs faster than planned. Have a good evening. The President of the Academy, the Vice Presidents, past Presidents, past Vice Presidents, Fellows of the Academy, our special students, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's proceedings. But we want to acknowledge the presence of the following schools. Accra Technical Training College, Accra Girls School, Accra College of Education, Accra Wesley Girls, Regional Water and Environmental Sanitation Center from Kumasi. Shall we clap for them, please? We'd also want to thank the chairman 
for steering us to the end of this session. Shall we please all rise? We would have refreshment outside. The fellows will meet in the usual place. Okay. The students will be catered for here. The students should stay in. You'll be catered for here. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.